Hello, Bibliolauts. Welcome to our read-along of the Phenomenology of the Spirit. Welcome along if you have been following, and if you have not, you just um, stumble across this video. This is the perfect video to stumble across because this is probably the most important, the most influential chapter of the Phenomenology of the Spirit. I can't believe it. Is this a hair? Well, this is how you can tell. Oh, that's disgusting. That's gross. This, uh, this is how you can tell that I have been reading it and <laughs> falling asleep on it. Um, yeah, okay. <laughs> I, I, this is the moment when I would like to be able to edit videos so that I can cut that out. However, let's get back to the book. <laughs> I, um, I just finished the Lord, Lordship and Bondage uh, chapter. And, um, yeah, I... I think um, it's definitely the most influential. I I am rereading Hegel, but this is the time where I am actually understanding the book. And um, I have read most of the people that is influenced by him, like all the existentialists, phenomenologists as well, and in Marx as well. And all of them sort of um, uh, intersect in this chapter. Let's do a recap, and this is why I say that this is the best video to come. This is the best video of all the ones that I've made about Hegel so far, except for the first one. This is probably the best one to come across if you haven't been following along, because I'm, I'm going to do a quick recap. This is going to be an a, a, a overview of the steps that got us to the dialectic of lordship and bondage and to the necessity of mutual recognition, which is really what we are concerned with on this video. Um, so we start the book and Hegel was, um, okay, you know what? I'm going to give you absolute knowledge if you read this book. And you're like, what the fuck is that? Absolute knowledge. That sounds a bit uh, woo-woo, right? Um, well, he says, no, uh, absolute knowledge is just knowledge about the fact that we can know things at all. So knowledge about knowledge, knowledge about how is it possible that we can know. And because knowledge of facts is always isolated, it's also always contextual. But if you can understand the mechanisms of knowledge, not in an epistemological sense, but in an ontological sense almost, um, you will be able to understand everything. That's, that's the bold claim that he makes at the beginning of the book. And then you're like, okay, so how are you going to give me that exactly? And he will tell you. Uh, well, I mean, uh, there is this method that I have. It's called uh, dialectics, and basically, it has to do with um, looking at the intersection of two of of two opposed uh, forms of thinking or thoughts or concepts or anything. Um, so basically, it's a dualistic uh, form of thinking, right? You have black and white. You have any thought, right? And the way dialectics works is, you have an affirmation as you cognize the world, you have an affirmation. That affirmation brings you to um, a negation of that affirmation when you realize of its faults. And after making that negation, you realize of the faults of the negation and the truthfulness of the first affirmation. And you make a negation of the, of the, of the first negation. And that is what people would call normally thesis, um, antithesis, and synthesis. And the reason why this is very important is because that, uh, of course, it's a dialect is a methodology for um, cognition. And that is because uh, Hegel sees uh, consciousness, which is really what um, is promising to, 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 to teach you about. This is not a book about humans, this is a book about consciousness. Um, yeah, so consciousness um, is an authority for the intelligibility of nature. Consciousness, the main characteristic of consciousness is that it sees, it, it gives itself the responsibility of knowing. Um, so now we have all of those things, right? And now we're, okay. So we have consciousness. I am consciousness and I have the authority of the intelligibility of nature, whatever that means. I have to understand the world. Uh, and through understanding the world at some point, through this methodology of dialectics, I will somehow arrive at absolute knowledge, um, which there is many stages. And today we are happy if we can get to mutual recognition or self-consciousness as well, but uh, no further than that. 
um, which is half of the book at this point. We are pretty much on the halfway point and the most important half, I think. I don't think I'll get dedicate as much uh, time to the second half. So what can we know then? This is a very Cartesian moment. Uh, okay, yeah, we have to start somewhere. And Hegel says, well, if we're going to start somewhere anywhere, we have to start in the particular. We have to start in sense certainty. I... This is not mine, I wouldn't take a shell from the sea, but it was here. Um, so I touch this, right? And now I'm, I don't call this shell because shell is already um, limited to certain categories. I call this the this, meaning um, this is the thing that sense certainty tells me it's real. This is the first thing that I can know it's real, it's reality, it's existence at all about. Um, but further on, Hegel is like, I mean, when I say that this, really, I am talking about a, a conditional, conditional universal, because the this really just means the here and now, right? I'm looking at this, but if I just say the this, that wardrobe over there is also the this, right? That lamp is also the this, this is also the this, all of this is here and now. Um, so how is this going to be distinguished from every other this that is here and now if I only refer to it as the this? And that's how we go from the particular, from, okay, truth is not based on certainty, it's based on concepts, it's based on some um, something other than the thing itself, because if I only look at the thing, then I'm not getting closer to it. I'm just like getting closer to my own spatial and temporal um, situation. So now we are in a conditional um, universal, a universal because, you know, there's many things that are here now. And But Hegel was to write back at the, at the thing, because if we cannot um, know the object, we cannot know anything. Uh, so he comes back and he's like, okay, mm, have this now, right? Um, that this was not enough. So let's call it the thing with properties. And let's describe it so much that I will finally get at the reality of the thing, at the, what the thing is. I don't know why I'm holding this side because the other side is actually much cooler. <laughs> now, what are the properties of this rock? Um, it's rounded. It's gray. It's relatively small, but it's quite heavy. And the problem is that then you look at the thing with properties and you look at every single one of those properties, rounded, small, uh, heavy, and you realize that every single one of those properties that we attribute to the um, thing that we call rock can be attributed to many other things. There are many rounded things, there are many small things, and there are many heavy things in the world. So that just gives us back just take us out of the particular again and into the universal uh, to a universal inconditioned because this um, these uh, properties are no longer conditioned by uh, time and space but they are just properties that are universal and, and inconditioned that can be attributed to pretty much anything uh, so there we are we are again uh, further away from the object we don't know what we are what the fuck is going on so we need to go back to the thing but how are we gonna do that because at this point, we have basically lost the grasp of the object. Well, here Hegel makes quite a few twists and, twists and turns, and this is not about this part of the book, so I'm going to just uh, push through it. But basically, um, he looks then at the temporality, at the at change, basically, at the change of between this here and that here, right? The difference, the thing that makes um, uh, the thing with properties that I am seeing that thing, the thing that makes me real as well, is that there is a continuity, there is a change, and in that change I can also um, understand uh, certain laws, right? So rather than looking at objects now, since everything seems to be about concepts, we are looking at bigger, uh, like a greater scheme of reality, right? So as time goes on and I see things happening around me, I describe the world, and I describe it, that's why um, laws um, the scientific universal laws are tautologies because they do not explain the world but they describe it we 
we extract those loss from change. We extract those loss from any change in our environment. If um, I throw that rock that I just saw and the rock falls from that, I can infer the law of gravity. But the law of gravity is just a description of what just happened. I didn't create the law of gravity. I didn't either even explain it. I only said when things, when I throw things, they fall. Um, and this is also a critique of science, right? Um, if you go to the, um, if you go to a psychiatrist and tell them that you have depression, um, and you ask them why do I have depression, they will be uh, because there are certain um, things in your brain that there are certain hormones in your brain that are chronically malfunctioning. Um, you might not have enough dopamine, or you might generate too much cortisol, uh, or anything like that. And you're like, okay, but why? do those um, things uh, trigger uh, my depression? Why am I having depression? Why am I sad? And they will be, yeah, because uh, when those neurons go up, uh, this other thing goes down, and then uh, that triggers depression. <laughs> that triggers your, the sensation that you call depression, the, the, the sadness that you call sadness. And they, they will never get beyond that. You will, you will never, in most cases nowadays in science, you might add to some degree, but mainly, our understanding of the world is purely descriptive. We don't have genuine explanations for why things happen. We can only get at the loss and be like, this is going to happen. This is very human in the sense of like, uh, all knowledge is based on an own habit, on custom. Um, we just describe what's going to happen because it happens and it will happen. But it's a cause and effect thing. It's not that we really know the reasons behind. Uh, that's not really telling me why, I, why when that or hormone goes down or up, um, I actually feel sad, right? Um, so it's in that tautology, there is still some um, some truth, right? Because it allows you to to have certain intelligibility or, or at least being able to predict what's going to happen around you, to describe the world, to begin to describe the world, allows you to um, to find in in describing everything as opposed to you, because that's also how dialectics works, right? Like um, I'm describing. Uh, <laughs> I'm not gonna take anything else, but I'm describing this book, right? And as I describe it, and I describe its properties, and I describe its, its um, relations to those laws that I'm drawing around me, I see its difference and I consume the object. I it, The object becomes an instrument for me, uh, just like um, every other object. I when I When I eat, when I see an apple, I see food, I eat the apple, and the apple disappears in my hands. It becomes, um, it becomes a mere instrument um, for consciousness. And that's that's part of the argument that Hegel wants to make here. There is a, a, a way in which uh, consciousness wants to dominate conceptually its environment. Everything that I see, I see for my own ends. And, I, and, and that's the only way I'm able to conceive the world, is as an instrument for myself, which is an incredibly selfish, it reminds me of Max Stirner's uh, anarchism, um, an extremely selfish way of looking at the world. Um, so, the problem with that, though, is that the most, the most um, yearned for, the most longed for uh, certainty that consciousness wants is not certainty about objects, it's not even certainty about the world, it's certainty about itself, it's self-certainty. And objects cannot give it that self-certainty because they are mere instruments. He, uh, consciousness takes those objects that uh, passive, that only act passively um, towards it, and makes makes them it, itself. It it basically it molds the world around it, right? I see a house and I say house. That's home. That's a place where people live, right? Or where I will live. That's a car. A thing that I will drive. Um, if someone from another planet came, you wouldn't see the you would you would not see the car as car. It would be something hard to cognize because it's the product of our intelligibility of nature. When someone looks at a tree, they see the wood, they see the the shadow under the sun that will that it will give them under the sun or the um, feature of contemplation. Um, all of those things are subjects uh, in the sense of um, subjugated. To the powers of uh, consciousness. The only thing that consciousness cannot control, the only thing that consciousness cannot um, make itself, is another self-consciousness. 
So the moment in which self-consciousness arrives in, in contact with another self-consciousness is certainly a moment of conflict because consciousness is driven by desire, this desire to know. This desire to know is very similar to the Freudian uh, pleasure principle uh, in the sense of like, it's a desire of subjugation of nature through, con through concepts in order to understand it. But um, unlike every other thing, uh, um, obje objects are stationary to a degree, but uh, self-consciousness is not. Uh, another I is not, because as I am recognizing you, you are recognizing me back. If it's reciprocal, if it is, if it is reciprocal, because if it's not reciprocal, then there is no recognition, and then the one of us can never arrive, or neither of us can ever arrive to a mutual recognition, which is um, a requirement for self consciousness, for self certainty. Self consciousness, you have it already, but you want to arrive at self certainty. Um, so it is on on this uh, collision between the two eyes that. Uh, recognize each other, that choose to recognize each other, and that in choosing to recognize each other, see the difference from each other and see themselves acknowledged from another authority of the intelligibility of nature. You know, in the hier in the military hier hierarchy, if you want to report uh, by bad behavior, you can only do it when it's about, uh, at least in the past, um, it used to be that you can only report uh, any bad behavior if it's someone that is of your same class. If it's someone that is uh, on a higher rank than you are, then you are not allowed to, right? So similarly, in terms of the authority of the intelligibility of nature, the epistemological authority, if you want, if you will, um, you need someone who is also that authority in order for their feedback to feel valid, in order to achieve self-certainty. And that happens. You get true self-consciousness and then you get that. You finally get a, a mirror-like interaction in which everything that you are throwing into this uh, I, I as the pronoun I, um, it's, give, it's getting back to you. The same action, the same dialectic interaction is, is, is getting back at you. And that is, um, is a moment of shock because it's, it's, the, it's the moment in which the first part, is the, the moment in which the self-consciousness en encounters a form of consciousness that is not willing to be bended over and, and molded and to become part of itself is the first thing that cannot be subjugated cognitively because it's another mind. And this will take us to a fight to the death um, in which neither of us, neither, neither of them can die, but one has to remain, wants to remain uh, above the other. So this is a very hierarchical battle. This is um, a duality in which both parts, which now is Basically, you can already see how we're arriving at the lordship and bondage and bondsman um, dialectic or master and slave, which is not really the, the proper translation. But if you prefer, uh, since it's so, so widely understood to be the dialectic of master and slave, we can use that. Uh, so um, the reason is because the only way, like both, both uh, self-consciousness are driven by this Freudian desire of wanting to make the world itself, to want into, I understand you, I understand you means I make you mine concept. I make you to the, to the geometries of my cognition. Um, and the same thing is happening on the other side, right? So there is a cognitive battle. And in this cognitive battle, uh, that, um, it seems a very epic, uh, almost Homeric um, um, interaction. One of them has to give in. One of the two eyes has to eventually give in. G uh, it gives in because one of them is willing to reach less. In a sense, um, love of death or lack of fear of death is the thing that will determine who, which is the master and which is the slave. Um, one that, once that is uh, determined, then the slave, the bondsman, will be subjugated under the command, the cognitive command of the master, which will be the one that determines the reality of the other. Both of them require, still require each other you know, for that cognition. The master, the, it's like, imagine a teacher in university. Imagine a teacher in university who doesn't have students, right? There's no teacher there. There's no, his whole, his whole purpose will be lost, right? 
However, there is still a hierarchical relationship between the teacher and the students. As much as a pedagogy want to, makes us want to believe otherwise, you're going into university or into any classroom for that matter uh, with one premise, that person knows more than you know. Therefore, I am there to receive more knowledge from this person than I am to give. That's where the hierarchical relationship comes in. Still, that person requires my existence in order for them to affirm their own as a teacher. Um, so it's in this dialectic where um, the, is, is this basically the dialectic of the master and life? Is where we want to leave things? Uh, but first I want to uh, highlight something. The interesting thing is that in Hegel's view, the bondsman is actually in some ways more privileged than the lords than the lord because the lord relies completely on the bondsman for its um, confirmation of for its own self certainty but the bondsman in having given in uh, for fear of death in having subjugated itself to the other consciousness can um, has now to work for it it has to follow its commands. It, it, this is where work, this is the very Marxist uh, part of the book. Um, this is where work comes in. Work as the act of creation of whatever the, the Lord uh, commands. But in that act of creation, in that working for the Lord, uh, the bondsman finds a new way of achieving that certainty. When you create something out of nothing, when you are able to mold uh, a piece of wood into a door, for example, uh, you are also achieving self-certainty because you are showing yourself a certain skill, a certain discipline, a certain capacity to change the world around you, a certain capacity to also um, master your desire. If you're working for someone else, you have to wake up at a certain time. You have to go to sleep at a certain time. You, even if you want to sleep for longer, you can't, right? Well, the Lord is, is basically spoiled and it becomes extremely dependent on the bondsman. This is the whole idea of, you know, this is why uh, Marx will later on say, you know, take this and say that the polar proletariat really have the power, that the power is in the people and all of that. Um, so what, what this means is that uh, at some point we arrive at the, uh, at the moment in which the bondsman no longer needs the master, but the master needs the bondsman. And, and this is probably the basis of Marx's uh, conflict theory as well. I don't know where else are we going on the book. But this is probably the most important thing to understand uh, in terms of its context uh, within the history of philosophy and many other, because this is, this is not just in philosophy, like the dialectics of uh, master and slave are all over literature, um, arts and everything. So I hope you understood uh, something about it and let me know what you, what you make of it, if you have been reading the book. Let me know if you think it's plausible, let me know if you, like I, think that that hierarchical contraposition in a moment in which imperialism was so prominent in the in Western thought, um, being, uh, especially uh, coming from a German, uh, might reflect more of um, more um, of the biases of Hegel than of the universality of um, cognition in terms of in the terms that he presents. I certainly think that there is um, many ways in which uh, he's taking a model of cognition, a model of, um, of um, a personality type and universalizing it. I, I am not sure. I am not sure that I think myself that mutual recognition is necessary in order to achieve self-certainty in, in the most um, general sense. Um, I don't think that I need to be recognized by another, by someone who I recognize as an authority for the intelligibility of nature in order to believe in my own existence. I think that my own existence is enough for me to believe in that. Uh, but I think that uh, it certainly resonates with at least um, a lot of things that we can see around the world. I think that this book is, is genuinely doing a serious attempt to explain the world in its own terms. And because of that, I... I'm, it's growing on me. I like this chapter. Uh, <laughs> I'll say that. And yeah, I'll, we're not going to leave things here. Uh, let me know what you thought about it. Any questions that you may have. If you are following along or if you have already read it a while ago and you want to talk, the comments is the place. Or maybe make a video. That'd be even cooler. Thank you and I'll see you on the other side.